was I was telling the uh, fellows upstairs uh, that were waiting in the library, and uh, the uh, last time I was in the library about 50 years ago, <laughs> and um, I related a story. Um, I used to live. The library had stalls that were about this this big, where you could close the door. And I used to go up onto the seventh floor of the library in my sleeping bag because I had no place to sleep. That's where I lived. And I'd have, they didn't have big bottles of water in those days, but I would have a case of beer and a sleeping bag, but I didn't use the library to study. I didn't use the library to study. Well, I'm very pleased to be here, and I was brought to my attention uh, earlier that uh, this is the first university that I've ever uh, spoke at in Asia. So this is my first university. Thank you. Uh, notwithstanding, my wife and I have lived in India almost nine, or excuse me, three years. We lived in the uh, Philippines almost nine years. And we lived in China uh, about one year. I never spoke at any of those universities, uh, any of those. I'm uh, hoping that this is the first of many opportunities. Now, I normally open up my talks, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. What I'm going to say here today is going to offend many of you. I don't go out of my way to offend you, but I will. But if I leave here today and you like me, I fucked up. <laughs> I'm not here to make friends. If you want a friend, buy a goddamn dog. Okay? And uh, I think somebody in part of my introduction has already told you I spoke at Oxford University and some very prestigious schools. And, the, uh, and I'm very, very happy uh, that Sally and I, my wife, were able to spend a few days here. Now, yesterday, we were um, uh, by helicopter to uh, near the uh, base camp of Mount Everest. And uh, the guide asked me to ask you, how many in the audience have been to Mount Everest? <laughs> Not one hand, just like he predicted. Well, my wife, yeah, my wife and I. Yeah. <laughs> it was uh, quite an experience, and I'm not easily uh, pleased. And um, part of the, the reason that I am who I am, and I use that word as a segue, is that 99.9% .9 of the planet, that's 99.9% .9 of the se over 7.5 billion people that are on, on the planet today are pleasers. You want to be liked. Some of you even want to be loved. You don't want people to say bad things about you. People commit suicide because you're unliked, etc., on Facebook. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it uh, should be a badge of honor, but Facebook just blocked me about three weeks ago. I'm permanently blocked from Facebook forevermore. So that may be that I finally hit the pinnacle of my success when Facebook blocks me. But seriously, kids, and I call everybody kids because I'm either old enough to be your father or grandfather, if you want to be liked in life, you're going to have a hard fucking time. Everybody got silent. <laughs> Asians, by definition, want to be liked. That's not good. And if got the job done, you would be sitting in here. Love nor religion don't get the goddamn job done. I'm going to say it again slowly. Love and or religion do not get the job done. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. But I'm the only one that I know of that preaches this. And I preach it because I tell you the cold, hard facts. Because I don't give a shit if you like me. I sure as shit don't want you to love me. And Sally and I don't need any more kids. So we're not going to adopt you. <laughs> Did we get the school's name right? There was some, there was some, uh, uh... now we've been to beautiful places. Yesterday, we're going to add to this slide, we've been to the North and the South Pole, my wife and I both. And now we're going to, I'm going to add Mount Everest onto the beautiful places. And obviously, North and the South Pole are two different ends of the uh, continent. 
And so, although my wife doesn't like me saying this, I consider us bipolar now because we've been to both poles. <laughs> but my wife and I have also been married at both poles. So we renewed our vows at both poles. But the, the fact that none of you have been to Mount Everest, I would highly recommend that you go. Now, this is what I was expecting when we landed. <laughs> now, we have gone to some temples, uh, etc., cetera, but uh, not, none of them were as majestic as that. Um, we did see that. And uh, I think we're going to see that before we leave. Uh, but it's a beautiful country, and you've got a lot of lovely things. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> But like anything else, you don't appreciate what you have. Just as when I asked the question about how many of you have been to uh, Mount Everest. Uh, and I was surprised because when that, our guy told us that, I thought, no, that's bullshit. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And, uh, but um, uh, when you, um, before you buy that new car or that secondhand car, go see some of the beauty in your own country, which is uh, Mount Everest. Now, I always connote Nepal with Shangri-La, that mystical heaven on earth or heaven in the mountains, in the Himalayan mountains. Well, I haven't witnessed any of that, although I must admit, I felt not holier, but I felt a little different after we went up 18,000 feet. And Sally, my wife, said, that's just the lack of oxygen, Dan. It's not that you think that you're in heaven yet. I haven't seen that yet. We're still looking for that. Still looking for that. Now, some people say that I'm different, and I am. On August the 6th and August the 9th of 1945, two horrific things happened in the world. They dropped two atomic bombs, one on Hiroshima and one on Nagasaki. There used to be a theory and for, especially for engineering, engineering students, we're all energy, right? Forget we come back as a dog or a spider or whatever, if you believe in that. But the world changed when they dropped that first atomic bomb. And then the world changed even more when they dropped the second one. I was born the day after this last bomb was dropped. And the purists, the theorists, say the world energy level, the DNA molecules change for fucking ever on the planet. And the closer you were born to those two events, the more different you are. I don't know anybody that was born as close as I was. So some people say that's why I am the devil reincarnated. Maybe so, but I am certainly different. I am certainly different, and um, it's only become popular, my difference, my differences, the last four or five years. Part of those differences are attributed to the current president of the United States, Donald Trump, which I have to give full disclosure, I know him. But whether you hate him or love him, most people hate him, but whether you hate him or love him, he has changed the financial fabric of this plan forever and ever and ever. You cannot deny that. Finance is not the same. I go to universities, even engineering schools. Uh, the last engineering school I spoke at, I believe, was in Poland, in Krakow. And I asked, how many classes have you had in buying a business? No hands go up. How many classes have you had in selling a business? No hands go up. How many classes have you had in leadership? And leadership meaning me getting you to, what, to do what I want you to do when I want you to do it. No hands go up. Yet those three subject matters, if you're ever going to leave school, and I hope you do, although I do know that there are perpetual students that are here forever, you're going to have to learn that to go out and if you want to start a business or even you want to get a job. The world has changed, and currently, not just in this school, but in schools around the world, they're teaching what was popular 40, 50, 60 years ago. 
They're not teaching what's popular today to get a goddamn job. They're not teaching today how to support your family. And I realize Asian, that means extended family, you know, cousins and everybody else. They're not teaching you those things. Why? Your guess is as good as mine. I am now more commonly referred to as the trillion dollar man. Thank you. The greatest all time wealth creator. I am the only coach, mentor, teacher, whatever you want to call me, that has created millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions, tens of billions, and hundreds of fucking billion dollars. I am it. You may like me, I hope not, but I am it. And everything that we're going to talk about today, and probably 99% of all the questions I'm going to answer during Q&A are on my website free. I give everything away free. I have not given a seminar outside Guthrie Castle, our home, uh, this century. Although I am giving one on January 18th for the first time um, to uh, ostensibly quell uh, all the interests, but it doesn't seem to have quelled the interests. My seminars at the castle are sold out for a year in advance. Now, why is it that my demographics have switched in the last 10 years from 35 to 55 years of age to 15 to 35 years of age? How is that possible? That 20 years have been taken off the average age, or actually the mean age, of my demographics. Because whether you're a student or not a student, the kids are getting smarter. Kids don't lack intelligence today, they lack leadership. We have 15-year-old kids, we actually have 13-year-old kids that are putting what you're going to hear today into place. 13 years old. Now for you boys, I know what you were doing at 13. I know what you were doing at 13. You were making your laptop sticky. <laughs> are there any, could the girls raise their hand so I can see how many girls are in the audience? Okay, okay ladies, I apologize in advance but for what, how I'm gonna talk later, the rest of the day. <laughs> but the demographics have changed. Yet I'm teaching the same stuff I taught in 1993 when I decided to start coaching and I gave my first seminar in May of 1993. QLA gives you the choice to die financially standing like a man or a woman or continue and die on your financial knees living quiet lives of desperation as your parents did. Now I know you understand living, not as students because you, most of you aren't working, hand to mouth, meaning paycheck to paycheck. Your parents live paycheck to paycheck. Your grandparents live paycheck to paycheck, meaning there's no money left over for anything other than putting food in your mouths and some clothes on your back. We're in the 21st century. Life ought to be better than that in the 21st century, but it's not. And it's even worse in third world countries like Nepal like uh, Bangladesh, like Sri Lanka, and many of the South American countries. And if love got the job done, we wouldn't be here. I'm here to tell you love doesn't get a goddamn thing done. And unfortunately, either does that. Because if that were true, then the most poverty-stricken countries that are the most religious countries wouldn't be so fucking poor. Because they're the most religious. They've lost hope. And they think that the Savior is going to come again. Well, I'm the closest goddamn thing to a motherfucking Savior you're ever going to meet. This is a, this is a, a worldwide statistic, higher in this country. 50% of the people will run out of money before they run out of time. In other words, 50% of the planet will die poor. They will die poor and they're going to have to have their kids and grandkids take care of them. 
You can relate to that, can't you? Back in caveman days, when I should have lived, 40 or 50,000 years ago, when my teeth fell out, my kids would chew my food and give it to me so I could swallow it. Well, it's not much different here now. The only difference is you're not chewing their food. Most Asian children are expected to be the pension plan, the welfare plan, the support plan of, for their parents. I think that's wrong. No, I don't think it's wrong. I know it's wrong. We were saying upstairs in the, in the library, the 40% of the planet at least are Asian. At least 40%. So actually, as a lobbying factor, you should control the planet. Now, people talk about China with a billion and a half or so. They talk about India with about a billion and a half or so. So that's about three billion. And there's at least a billion of you in all the other countries, uh, including this fine country of Nepal. So why don't you have more to say about what the fuck happens on the planet? Lack of leadership. Because unfortunately, most of the Asian countries have corruption throughout government. You can tell I'm not running for office down here, okay? Most of the countries have corruption. And corruption and poverty are tough to break the cycle of. They're tough to break the cycle of. Now, people look at that photo of my wife and I, and they think that that's how we prance around the castle. It isn't. Uh, but that's how we dress when we're having guests, as we do from time to time. But that seems like, I'm sure, a different world away from you. But if I, you saw me running around in my boxer shorts and a t-shirt that says, fuck you, on it, you could probably relate that more to the image that I have. But that's possible for anybody. Some of you realize I was a barrio bad boy. In jail five times. Flunked out of university three times. A lot, a lot of trouble. Did a lot of awful things, which I'm not proud of. And yet here I am. And there we are. Sally and I argue from time to time, who was more poor growing up? Her or me? For a spousal reasons, I finally agreed that she was more poor than I was. <laughs> but it's only spousal reasons. But we were both poor. And, and Sally was successful in her own right when we met oh, these many decades ago. But the, the fact is, that can be more than a dream for you or whatever the equivalent thereof is for you. For more than my 25 years, I've been the Leonidas of financial planning, coaching. Leonidas, the guy from the movie 300. I've coached against the grain for 25 years. I have told you that the financial system isn't corrupt, but it's ass backwards. People ask me, why don't they teach at the big schools? And from this, my next speaking engagement is at Wharton, University of Pennsylvania, why don't they teach at Wharton? Why don't they teach at Stanford? Why don't they teach at Oxford what I teach for free for 25 years? Because on the scale from 1 to 10, it only provides a 1 for the fees for the financial institution to charge. Because my system is commercial debt driven, meaning it's borrowing money from banks. And I realize interest rates are higher here. I understand that but it's not with any equity injection. In other words, you're not looking to somebody else to put money out. That's the only reason it hasn't been taught because it's been, this model has been used since 1860. And the first person to use it, the recorded person to use it was Andrew Carnegie, the famous little Scotsman who at that time was the richest man in the world who coincidentally comes from right down the road where Sally and I live in Dunfermline, Scotland. This system, where measurable expectations are demanded, now, hopefully, in school they demand you to study, otherwise you're not going to graduate. I don't know. Uh, since I flunked out of university three times, I'm not the best one to judge. Although, I did come back to university and graduated with honors and finished a four-year degree in two and a half years. But 
Today, a youth, a young man, asked me earlier, uh, how do I man up? What he was asking me is, how do I grow a pair of balls? How, how do I act like I had a pair of balls? How do I act like I stand at the urinal instead of squat over the urinal? Because most people today are snowflakes. They melt under pressure. We have had people shit their pants in this audience, which you're about to hear tonight. We have had people piss their pants. We have people pass fucking out. We have people break into crying. We've had people run out like they're going to jump in front of a truck on the street. Because the fucking truth hurts. And you've got nobody to blame but your parents. And they have nobody to blame but their parents. And today, 95% of this audience still want to please their parents who fucked you all up. Ask yourself why. It's in your DNA. And it's especially high in your DNA if you're Asian. There's a lot of great things about being Asian, but being a fucking pleaser is not one of them. Today I'm going to teach you, not teach you, but lead you based on my 50 years experience coaching and mentoring kids to be more than they ever dreamt they could be. High performers in everything you do. My most successful Asian mentee is a guy named Dan Locke. And Dan is going to come into the Castle Seminar next week uh, with his lovely wife, who Sally and I both know, and his right-hand guy, a guy named Desmond, uh, for a refresher course, if you will. Uh, because it's tough when you're the only guy out there on the battlefield. It's tough when you've got nobody to turn to. It's tough when you have nobody that can relate to your dreams. When he came to me in 2003, as I told the guys up in the library, he had holes in his socks. He had holes in the bottom of his shoes. He had a suit that wasn't his. I believe it was his uncle's. He could hardly speak English. And he flew from Vancouver. He borrowed the money and he, he bought me breakfast in Los Angeles. And now, by everybody's standards, he's filthy rich. Now money's not everything. It's the only thing anybody counts, though. Money's not everything. But if you want to go save the fucking world, bake a bunch of money, then go save the world. Because until you make the money, like the Gateses and the Warren Buffets, etc., you don't have a chance of changing a goddamn thing. Wake up. Get real. You pissed a lot of people off. What did you do? I told them the fucking truth. The Oxford kids heard the same thing that you're about to hear. There's a few more examples in this because I've been doing this now three years longer. Now, QLA teaches you not to be in the top, or that's the bottom, in the top 2%. QLA teaches you to be in the top one-tenth of a percent. And I know that's a tough concept to grasp here in Nepal. I know it's a tough concept to grasp if your dad isn't already rich, if your family hasn't been rich for generations, or he's a politician stealing. I understand that, but it's not impossible. It's only impossible, and one of the only guarantees I give in this seminar, if you quit, you'll never make it. That I guarantee. I could have quit five times in jail, flunked out of university three times, did stiff stuff that's ugly beyond your wireless comprehension. But I wanted to be more than that. I wanted to break the cycle of poverty. That's not exactly what I dreamt of, but it's close enough for government work. But I had a dream. I wanted to be in a castle on an island. Well. Oh, we're on an island, and that's close enough for government work. I dreamt that. It consumed every thought. I didn't have a pot to piss in, nor a window to throw it out of. I didn't have a, that's another way of saying I didn't have a fucking dime. 
I didn't have five rupees. I asked um, you, uh, what, what can you buy for five rupees? He says, nothing. So why do they even have the bill? But that's a whole other story, okay? Um, but I had a dream. And so I made it my business to be exposed to the highest performance people I could find. And in the beginning of my life, that was the military. And the military is what made me, uh, turn me from a boy to a man. And now the $50 billion man. And, uh, but I'm not the only one that's been saying this stuff, or this shit, as you would say. Strange times are these in which we live old and young, are taught falsehoods in school. And the person that dares to tell the truth is called at once a lunatic and a fool. Plato said that about 425 years before Christ was born. People have been talking this shit for thousands of years. Genghis Khan rode either not directly through here, but close, in, close enough for government work. He talked shit since he was 13, 14, 15 years old. Now, I'm not recommending you rape, pillage, and plunder like he did. The pillage and plunder's okay, the rape's not. But when I, we were at uh, Mount Everest yesterday, a lot of people looked um, uh, like Genghis Khan there. And I mean, one of the guys that was uh, helping us, no, he, he could not reach my arm standing underneath my arm. So I don't know how tall that is, but it's not very tall, is it? Now, I, I was saying when we first got here, I feel extremely tall in this country. You know, like a giant. I have not seen anybody in the country since I've been here that's tall, even remotely close to tall as me. And in America, I'm a tall guy, but I'm not that tall. You know, in America, I'd have to be like this tall in comparison. But people have been talking that there's inequalities, inequities in life long before Dan Pena came along. And for those of you, Jack Welch, the former CEO of uh, uh, General Electric, uh, in my judgment, the finest CEO in the last 100 years, said, there's no such thing as work-life balance. There are work-life choices, and you make them, and they have consequences. Being a high-performance person 100% of the time, being all you can be, is a full-time job. There are no part-time high performers. I took Dan Locke with 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 years of his hard work, and now he's people that, especially Asians, hold him up with a great deal of respect. I'm gonna be his keynote speaker at his black tie thing in September in a few weeks. Um, and I've seen some pictures of the last one. It looks like nine million Chinese. I know they're not all Chinese, but they all look Asian for sure. And I'm sure there's other kind of Asians in there. But uh, now he is a big fucking hitter. And he's a, a tremendously successful role model for especially Asian kids. Now, I asked him, what do you want me to talk about when I'm there in a couple weeks? And he gave me this list, but he says the, the, the bottom in big capital letters is, or was, Dan, that just because they're a high ticket closer, and high ticket closer in uh, Dan Locke's uh, vernacular is making $100,000 a year or more, six figure income, is how do we turn a six figure kid into a seven or even eight figure kids? I have mentees that I've produced in the last 26 years that make five, six, seven million a month dollars, not rupees. <laughs> How's that possible? because they work 120 hours a week. Now, I've not met one Nepalese kid that even likes working 40 hours a week. Get the difference, 40, 120, that's a... Even if you're stupid, you're gonna get two or three times more work done. Does every, all you engineers understand that? There's, no, there's only one Asian face on this, but this is you, and they're your goals. How do I get my dreams accomplished? Well, you gotta go through your pessimist to start off with, and then the fear of rejection, and we all have fear of rejection, myself included. 
Then you got to go through friends, just general haters. Now that hater, if he's not Asian, I'll kiss your ass. <laughs> I mean, absolute. One thing that Asians suffer from is what it's called the crab pot syndrome. There's a bucket of crabs, and one crab gets his hook on the outside and starts to pull himself out, and the other four or five crabs pull him down by his other claws. And then you've got general fear. You've got society. Your general guilt. Do, do I deserve to be successful, more successful than my father, more successful than my best buddy? And then you've got general doubt, and then for some of you, you've got a boss. No wonder you don't reach your goals. But this little schematic is true of everybody, whether I was in an engineering school like I am tonight, or Harvard, or next week, University of Pennsylvania. We all have to go through those. In addition, you know, play it safe, the guy on the bottom there. You've changed, and when you start to be successful, you've changed, John, or you've changed, blah, blah. And because you want to be a pleaser, you go back to default. And default's a bitch. Default is where you were. And then you should be happy with what you have. How many times have you heard about that? Well, where I come from, and I'm a first generation Mexican, my mother and, grand, uh, my mother and grandmother swam across the Rio Grande River as illegal aliens. Illegal, illegally. My mother was illegal until she was in her early 30s. My cousins, hardworking guys, plumbers, carpenters, the successful ones were school teachers, policemen. Now we have a doctor, now we have an accountant, now we have even a judge. But when I was a kid, I had no role models. And I knew I had to leave the barrio. And I knew I had to leave because the familia, the family, is not dissimilar to an Asian family. And I went to Europe. And I went more specifically to, to, to the, the UK. Now, what you've heard today, that's dinosaur shit. About being successful or being a high performance is just a load of shit. Because nobody that I know of say four or five guys and a couple gals, tells you what it really takes to be a high-performance person. The first thing they tell you is you can be a part-time high-performance person, which isn't true. Kids are not programmed for success because you did what not your parents told you to do, you did what you saw your parents do. If your parents never left Nepal, there's a slim chance you're ever going to fucking leave in Nepal. If you've been here since Genghis Khan, and some of you probably have, I'm telling you right now, leave on the first bus, because I know you can't afford a plane. <laughs> and I don't know if the buses are like in India, where the buses, there's holes in the floor. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Now, some kids are programmed for success. This is Tiger Woods when he was three years old. Most people in the world have heard of Tiger Woods. He just won the Masters. He's arguably the greatest golfer in the last 50 years. But he was, his dad was programming him to be high performance. And there he was last year winning the Masters in, in America, which is one of the major tournaments. He was programmed, but most of us, most of you assuredly weren't programmed to be a high performance person. Most of you weren't uh, uh, trained to be a world class person. Most of you were not trained by parents that were capable of sending you to the Olympics. Not the Olympics where you run and jump, and, but the Olympics of life. How do you get to be a gold medal holder in whatever you do? Well, you have to model yourself after a gold medal holder, i.e. me, or your parents had to be gold medal medalists. Very few people have had that privilege. Yeah, I told you I'm first generation, or I got ahead of myself. And my parents, unlike your parents, your parents trained you like you, they, you, they were trained. 
This is what my parents did living in the barrio, because they didn't want me to be another Mexican kid that spoke English with an accent. I, I can't imitate my Mexican accent very well anymore, so I'm not going to pretend to. But number one, they gave me dancing lessons. To take dancing lessons in the barrio was a fucking death wish. And not the modern dance, but ballroom dancing. <laughs> it was a death wish. Next, they gave me free golf lessons at the park. Nobody played golf in the barrio of East Los Angeles. Nobody. Next, they gave me free tennis lessons at the park. Nobody played tennis, let alone in golf and did, could a ballroom dance. Next, they allow me to believe in whatever the equivalent of Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, you know, the things that don't exist, but you think of as a kid, they still exist. They allowed me to think that freely until I was much older than all the other kids. Next, and probably most importantly, they never spoke Spanish, which was their primary language in the home. I never heard, and i.e. I speak English with no accent. When 95% of all my relatives speak Spanish with, or English with an accent, because my mother didn't want me to be discriminated against a white looking person speaking English with a Mexican accent. Next, my mother followed a book written by Dr. Benjamin Spock in 1946. Up until his death, it was the most highly purchased book on the planet, 55 million copies, but it basically told you how to rear a kid. And last but not least, they gave me classical music to listen to as a kid. Mozart, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky. Classical. Now, when you mix classical music, tennis, golf, and ballroom dancing in the barrio, it's a good thing I was a big kid. I got in a lot of fights, but I didn't get the shit kicked out of me as much as if I had been a little guy. They did all these things against the grain to make sure that I would not have the stigma of being a minority from East Los Angeles. And it worked. It fucking worked. This is our grandson. There's no way on God's green earth that he is not going to be exposed to every high performance trick, tip, scam that I'm aware of. And he's already started by wearing clothes like this. What were your parents doing? Anybody ever call you future legend? Many of you have been called, you're worthless, dipshit. You're never going to amount to anything. And unfortunately, though you're at a prestigious university, unless you do something with this education, they're going to be more right than you. They're going to be more right than you. We are brought into innocence to this life. Then life happens. The most info given in reference success is wrong unless you're lucky. Lucky enough to have high performance parents. You are forged by what you have seen and done. You do what you're, you see your parents do, and you're, you're seeing this, or your, your generation has been seeing this for 100 or 200 years. Uh, you're still here. In your entire lives, what have you experienced? Weak, lackluster parents, no high performance role models, low bar of expectations, Little or no accountability, little or no responsibility, leading to little or no accomplishments, leading to our snowflake society. My parents only had one goal for me growing up, was to keep me alive until the age of reason. They didn't know if that was going to be 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, just to keep me alive, because I was always pushing uh, the limits of stuff that I should do. Uh, or more importantly, stuff that I was not supposed to do. Unless you do for the students in the room, and we're mostly students, unless you do something with your education, it will be almost impossible for you to break the cycle of poverty. Nothing's impossible, but almost impossible. Unless you have dreams that outstrip and go far beyond your education, you will not likely break the cycle of poverty. 
Nepal is not a place people come to to get rich. Nepal, people come to to go to Kathmandu and go to Mount Everest. Tourism is a major lifeblood, lifeline for this country. There's a lot of countries that have prayed to Buddha, so you don't have, you don't have a, a lock on that. And there's a lot of countries that you can get to easier than come here to pray to Buddha. And yet most of you, except for the exception of the few that have looked at my website, because I say the exact same things on my website, um, have never thought of it because it's never been mentioned to you. I, I, I'd ask the administration here, although I'm happy to be here, you, what are you teaching the kids to do with their degree or multiple degrees when they get out of this place? It is one thing to study war and another thing to live the life of warriors. Now, ostensibly, allegedly, theoretically, you come from people like Genghis Khan's blood. And a few in the, uh, in the audience, I see the resemblance. Well, what Genghis Khan-ish have you done in your life? What risks have you taken? When I think back upon, and I don't uh, get unhappy too often, but when I think back upon um, some of the successes I've had, and they've been, you know, some of them have been overwhelming, and let's say I have a problem. I've got a couple of kids with you that are in the process of closing deals, and they're having problems. They're, um, and I'm here and they're there. And uh, the, uh, I just think back upon when I turned $60,000 into, you know, 100 million pounds in 99 days. And I can relive that experience and kind of fantasize. And they don't have any experience to relate to because they have nothing in their family background. Then nothing going back generations. And the only positive experiences they have are the experiences that they've uh, um, garnered from me by more or less osmosis. Because not, the Asians don't have a lock on wanting to fit in. Facebook, not, I said this before I got blocked or banned, maybe that's why I got blocked or banned, is a, a, a medium for neurosis. It builds and feeds on neurotic people. It builds and feeds on wanting to fit in and be liked. Which is unfortunate. The Chinese, your Asian brothers to the north or wherever it is, have uh, banned Facebook in many places and there is a place, a hospital they can take you where they de-Facebook you with electric, uh, electrodes in your brain. It's been proven at very prestigious medical schools that it feeds on neurosis, it builds depression, and makes you narcissistic. That I'm sure everybody in this room has a Facebook account, at least one. <laughs> now, this kid, doesn't know that he's engaging in dangerous activity. His level of fear is different than most of you in the audience. You can't tell that that kid, his pet would hurt him. And it's uh, Buddha's will that he doesn't hurt him. But this guy didn't have the same training. <laughs> he's running from these... Uh, Reptiles. And there I was when I'm 13 years old, wrestling with a lion, Jackie the Lion, of, if you get the Metro Golden Mayor movies here, or have ever seen any, it's the famous lion in the movies. Uh, my father tried to desensitize me to hard things. Well, I, he took me to this place called World Jungle Compound uh, to play with that lion. And the, the, the picture just before this, the lion had my head in his mouth. And right over here off camera is my hysterical mother screaming and yelling 
because she's afraid uh, I'm going to get hurt. Now, another way uh, my dad desensitized me, I used to, as a little four or five year old kid, used to run out in the street, as a, little, a lot of little kids do. And uh, I didn't ever get hit by a car, but my father said, well, I'm going to break him of this habit. We had a 1947 Willys. It doesn't matter. For, a Willys is a car that had side runners on the side where you could stand on, outside the door. And he said, well, if I bump him with a car and knock him down, he'll stop chasing the goddamn cars, so he thought. My mother thought it was a bad idea. She knew it was a bad idea. Well, but what if you make a mistake and you hurt him? Don't worry, I know how to do this, my dad said. So there was a piece of chrome that stuck out from the uh, fender. And when my dad nudged me with the car, the piece of chrome sliced through my knee, my leg, and came out the other side of my leg. And my dad didn't know this because he's sitting up in the car and I'm way down there. And he's driving along at one or two miles an hour, dragging me. I never stepped out in the street again. To this fucking day, I put, I put Sally out first. <laughs> now that would be considered barbaric. Well, it was barbaric. A lot of the things that my, my dad did to me would be considered child abuse. Not sexual child abuse, but beatings. Now, I didn't deserve to get my knee sliced open, but I certainly deserved 10 times more beatings than he gave me. Maybe 100 times more. And now, we have kids that come to the seminar. We have kids sitting in university audiences just like this that have never been yelled at, never been slapped, Never been uh, 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 spanked, I don't mean sexually spanked, but spanked, you know, with a switch. And look at what the results are. A society, two and a half generations of wusses. Wusses. And I know you're not proud of it, because I see our emails. You're ashamed of it. And you should be. <laughs> and here's Sally and I, trekking with the tigers. You see Sally, she's walking a little behind me. <laughs> but there's other pictures of her sitting with the, the tiger, is just as I am. Because we continue to stretch the envelope to push us outside our comfort zone. Most people in this room have never pushed yourself outside your comfort zone. Most people in this room don't have parents that have pushed themselves out of com their comfort zone. This is Sally and I up in Rwanda. That's Charlie, the silverback gorilla. And that's not a photo shot, because Sally and I were this close to the big silverback. He's got quite a life. He's got 15, 18 wives. All he does is eat and fornicate all day. Not a bad fucking deal, actually, when you think about it. And they've got guards that protect him from people coming and you know, trying to kill him. Sally and I trek with the lions. The, uh, and yes, once in a while, somebody gets eaten. But when I was at um, uh, Mount Everest yesterday at the most dangerous airport, what's it called? Kukula, Kukula Airport, the most dangerous airport in the world. I happen to ask our pilot, well, I mean, uh, how, uh, how often on this 500 meter uh, runway do people get hurt? And I said, there's a uh, old hull of a crashed out helicopter down there. He says, yeah, the pilot in the plane lost control and he crashed into a sitting helicopter just like we're in and killed, three people were killed. Now, they, the, the tour guide didn't tell us that part until we got up there. Um, but there are things, and we continue to do things to stretch our, our, our comfort zone. Coming to uh, Kathmandu didn't stretch my comfort zone. We lived in Asia 13 years. We know what the drill is. I still, that's five years old now, um, jumped out, uh, bungee jumped, New Zealand. And if you notice, normally the ropes are around your feet. Mine's around my waist because I had just had uh, two artificial knees put in. 
And if you jump out in the artificial knees, I mean, it's likely, I don't think it would have happened to me, they could have separated and I don't need aggravation. But they also told me, because I, I never read about how dangerous things are before I do it, I only read after. At my age, I was 67 then, when you snap at the end, your cataracts can come out when you're old. Well, that didn't happen either, so. And there, just recently, one of you showed me another crazy thing to do, and this is jump off the stratosphere in Las Vegas, 888 feet, uh, which was enjoyable, it was fun. A little scary, but not bad. But this picture is, is really uh, not true, because I didn't land on my feet. I landed my shoulder into the ground, but I decided for posterity that it'd be better if I, it looked like I was athletic and I landed on my feet. <laughs> Once you become fearless, life becomes limitless. Brian Rose, who some of you know from London Rio fame, uh, who really gave me my first exposure on uh, the internet five years ago, the, um, his life changed when he, and he's an engineer, an MIT engineer, when he discovered um, that he was not afraid of everything, but he was afraid of a lot of things, he shouldn't be afraid. And once you um, get over being afraid, and fear is false expectations appearing real, life is limitless. Just imagine one of the questions I ask in the seminar for homework, write on a piece of paper and be, pe be prepared to discuss it for five or 10 minutes. What would your life be like if you never feared anything? First question. Second question is, how would your life have changed? That's when the tears come. What would your life be if you had lived your life in a fearless manner? There are some leaders in the room. I don't know who they are. I'm gonna say something racist. Y'all look alike to me up here, except for a couple of white faces. There's, a, there's the Mong Mongolian side of you, and then there's an Indian looking kind of side of you. But based on, well, if I go like this and take my glasses off, now you do all look alike. <laughs> but leadership is not something that can be taught, it's learned by other leaders. And few of us, not myself, but few of the people on the planet have been exposed to true leadership. Command allows no intimacies, it's lonely at the top. One of the reasons Asians in general want to fit in is because they want to be able to commiserate. Misery loves company. Does everybody understand that? Being miserable, being depressed, you want to be around other people that are depressed because then you don't stand out. Instead of the, the, the corollary to that, High performance begets success, and success begets more success. Dan Loke is a super high performance Asian kid that I happen to have known for 16 years. He probably doesn't like the story about holes in his shoes and wearing his uncle's suit. Um, but when he interviewed me for four hours here a few months ago, I thought I was going to his $15 million penthouse he's got in Vancouver. He took me to his $35 million mansion that he now lives in. And his staff said that uh, we worked day and night to get it ready because we weren't sure it was going to be ready for your arrival, Mr. Pena. But he's a super high performance kid. And he's a great role model. And the reason why, one of the reasons why, other than he teaches great stuff, I, I agree with 99% of the stuff he puts out, is that he relates to the Asian kids. Um, because he, one, he is Asian, and two, he was dirt poor to begin with. Now, there's no doubt, I don't have to explain to you, the world's fucked up. There are riots everywhere. Now, Hong Kong, as when we left the hotel, they were talking about bringing in martial law. Now, if they bring in martial law to Hong Kong, to say that that is bad is an understatement a biblical proportion. <laughs> the Brits gave it up to him about 20 plus years ago, 22 years ago, as part of the treaty agreement. But now the young, your age kids in Hong Kong, many of which are students, they're mad and they're not gonna take it anymore. 
Just imagine if you, I'm not recommending riot or chaos here in, in, in Catman during Nepal, but just imagine if you did that. What would the police and or the army, the military, how would they treat you? If you started, I know there's been, there's been commotion. They fixed the road. We were on one real bad road day before yesterday. I mean, boom, 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 mud. And then we got to a real flat thing. It was like a super highway. We were in Britain. And I said, what the hell happened? He says, the people protested, had a big, not a riot, but they protested. And they took back some of the money that the contractors had stolen, I guess. And, and they built the road. Well, I'm not suggesting you do that, but just imagine if you did. Or just imagine if your parents had done that, or your grandparents had done that. Where would you be today? Oop. Princeton grad found guilty of murdering his father because he got his allowance cut. Now, I had to put this in here. The kid was cut his $1,000 a week which is a lot of allowance, especially when you're 32 years old. And so he decides to whack his dad. I'm also not recommending this, because I doubt if many of you in this room are on an allowance, and I'm absolutely fucking positive nobody's on a $1,000 a week allowance in this room. But this is how screwed up the world is. Now, uh, he doesn't look too remorseful to me, but you never know. When they come to uh, judging, he may be. I drove by a college today and yelled, boo. 35 people went to the hospital. 734 needed crisis counseling. 429 needed a safe area or room. Classes were canceled for a week. This was a school in America. I went through and I screamed at them. Do they have safe rooms here? So if life gets too tough, you can go hide? Thank you. <laughs> if your adult child needs a safe space to avoid offensive words, you failed as a parent. Now, for some of you, one of the things I ask yourself, what if you asked your parents some of the questions I've asked you here today? All the questions are on my website. You can easily get them. What chaos would it cause? What havoc? All on you. How willing are you to change the cycle that this country's been in a couple hundred years? Are you willing to do what the Chinese kids are doing in Hong Kong? Or some degree thereof? If anything in my seminar offends you, blame your parents for raising a pussy. Now, interestingly enough, even in Nepal, at six months, babies are normally happy, unless they have crap in their diaper, okay? At three years, they're still happy, happy slappy. Your life hasn't fucked them up yet, meaning your parents haven't fucked you up yet. At seven years, self-esteem is built the first seven or eight years of life. The first seven or eight years of life. The Catholic Church has a proverb. Sounds better in Latin, but I can't say it in Latin. Give us your children at seven or eight years old, and we will own them for life. I'm still a good little Catholic altar boy. And, I, you know, and that was 67 years ago for me. But then something happens. Normally, they blame teenage years on you're going into um, your puberty. But that's not really what it is. What it is, you're seeing your parents are fucked up, your grandparents are fucked up, the system's fucked up. And by the time you're 20, normally depression sets in. And by the time you're 25, you've probably hooked up with the wrong person. Most people in life get married for the wrong reasons. Most people in life uh, have kids for the wrong reasons, just as you were born for the wrong reason. 50% of you in this room are accidents. 
And if you want to prove my th theorem, not your mother. Moms deserve better than that. Go ask your dad if I was on purpose. <laughs> and when he goes like this, you have the answer. Most of you in this room were begat because your daddy wanted to get his willy wet. That's the only reason. Look at how the American sim, this is American manhood has changed from my dad's generation to current generation. Men back in the day, men today. I got a Nepalese haircut today. And I, I couldn't understand the other two guys in the other chairs. This was at the hotel we're staying at. But, uh, and the girls, I had a, a male barber, they had female barbers. And, um, the, uh, the, and, the, and the girls are giggling and they're giggling. I, I can imagine what they're talking about. But the, um, um, it, it was interesting. They both got body massages. I didn't want to have a head massage. I wonder why. Whoops. Some people say I'm the way I am because of the atomic bombs, but if the guys in the room will put up their left hand like this and see if this finger is longer than this finger, that's a testosterone test that's not only 99% accurate. So you may be the 1%. Josh Kim, on my, one of my, who's Korean, Asian, his testosterone finger is longer than his middle finger. So the little skinny shit has got high testosterone level. And testosterone is tied to aggression, amongst other things. Now, I have kids come to me that are so ashamed of being snowflakes, there are societies that you can go and get whipped like a dog. That's not a Photoshop, that's for real. He is a 28-year-old French property developer in Paris. It goes monthly to get his back laid open. Because he's ashamed of what he, and even though he's successful, he's ashamed that he's not a man. Like you asked me earlier. I can look at the audience and you've got plenty of guys that aren't men in this room. Notwithstanding, they have balls and testicles. If love got the job done, most parents would have produced high performers. It doesn't, I've said that. 87% of the world is unhappy. I say probably 98% of Nepalese people aren't happy. And they turn to religion. They're not the only ones that turn to religion. Religion is an opiate for the masses. It's a narcotic for the masses. It allows you to pretend you can be someplace else. Nirvana, I thought we were going to Nirvana Shangri-La yesterday, but we didn't make it there. It allows you to pretend. And here I am, I'll be 74 in a couple of days, this 74 year old man who lives in a castle, who is a bad boy, borrow a bad boy, telling you, love doesn't got the job done and neither does a religion. Life expands and contracts with courage through pain. All the audiences I've spoken before, had the privilege, would not take physical and or emotional pain and trade it for success. Almost all the audiences I've had the privilege to talk about, to, not about, from Oxford to here, would not trade emotional or physical pain for success. Does everybody fucking understand that? You didn't see your parents trade it. They didn't see their parents trade it. And we do what not we're told to do, we do what we see our parents do. So if your parents are weak wusses, the odds are, not 100%, but 
but almost 100%, you're going to be a week worse as well. Remember, I didn't come up here for you to like me. And if you like me when I'm done, I, did, I fucked up. I didn't do my job. Now, this is the main reason I am the man I am. Now, he's not a movie star. He's my dad. But he was a hard motherfucker. I mean, uh, it transcends the word hard. And this is not much of an exaggeration what he looked like. He had a 56-inch chest, he had 18-inch arms, he never lifted weights. He was a gymnast, high-caliber, all-American gymnast in high school. But when my mother said, I want you to do this, Danny, well, I don't want to do that. Well, I'm going to have to tell your dad when he comes home. Ooh, wait, 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 wait. Exactly what did you want me to do, Mom? Because I, I, the last thing is I wanted my dad. If I got beat by the nuns, when my dad got home, he re-beat me. If I got beat by the priests, when he got home, he re-beat me. The church was always right. Now, that was an exagger not an exaggeration on my part. It's an exaggeration on his part, because we all know the church isn't always fucking right. But anyway, and, but I never saw any sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. I sure as shit saw a lot of physical abuse. Beatings. Of course, I was getting them most of the time, but I, I, know, I know they beat people because I got beat. He was not a great father, but he was an extraordinary man's man, and it's the reason I'm here. Because he taught me, it's not what happens to you in life, Danny. It's how you interpret what happens to you in life. Everybody in this room knows somebody either personally or indirectly or directly that has had hardship in life. Right? Everybody. Some people handled it better than others. In India, they have leapers. The kids leap out of buildings if they get uh, de Facebook. They leap out of buildings if they get shitty graves. It's not what happens to you, because we all have problems in life. We all have uh, emotional bank accounts, and we have financial bank accounts. It's not the financial bank account, which I'm sure most of you are interested in. It's the emotional bank account. you got to be tough, mentally tough. Not physically tough, but mentally tough. I am indebted to my father for living, but to my teacher for living well, Alexander the Great. I think he came through here, too. Well, he wasn't spreading any Mongoloid, Mongolism, uh, or Mongolian, excuse me, uh, blood, but he was spreading his birth sperm for sure. We are shackled by our dad's sins. Most of the men, young men in this room, are shackled by the things your father either did or didn't do. Mostly didn't do, because they didn't set high standards. For some people in this room, just going to this prestigious school was the only goal anybody ever had for you. Mine was to just to keep alive. I, I went into university as a happenstance, and then I immediately flunked out. Um, and when I came back from the military, I made up for it. One who has not had a good father creates one. Most of the kids that I talk to one-on-one, -on -one, which isn't very often, when the conversation starts, their father, they have high regard for the father. By the time the conversation ends, they either have low regard or no regard for their father. If I really judge my father with high standards, he's a shitbag. That's a hell of a note. Because two and a half generations have grown up, not just here, around the world. Children, children begin by loving their parents after they judge them. Rarely, if ever, do they forgive them. On some level, and I'm explaining all this to you because unless you admit on a conscious level what brought you to be here, you can never fix it. 99.9% .9 of the people in this room's problems are emotional. Not financial, not spiritual, not family. Emotional. Because even though I've told you what your parents have been done to you, you still want them to like you. You still want them to love you. Because you've got that in your DNA. You've got that in your culture. I'm not telling you to go back and hate your parents. But you're never going to be more successful if you don't understand why you are where you are. You can get here the highest PhD or 
highest degree that they give. You can graduate magna cum laude, whatever. But if you don't straighten out your emotions, you're going to be fucked the rest of your life. It's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. I'm in the repairing broken men business. That means men and women, gals. Um, but I, the reason I talk at schools is because it's better for me to get a hold of them the younger they are. I've tried at grammar schools, they're too young. I've tried at junior high schools, they're too young. I've even tried at high schools, they're too young. University students are about the youngest that can relate and understand what I'm talking about. Sigmund Freud said, being entirely honest with oneself is a good exercise. And we're not. We fool ourselves, we bullshit ourselves, we cajole ourselves. We are never so defenseless against suffering as we are when we are in love. And you all want to be loved. I cannot think of any need in childhood as strong as the need for a father's protection. My father, when I was growing up, had a brother, he had several brothers and sisters, but his closest brother and sister used to tell my father, Manny, you're too hard on Danny, you beat him too much, etc." My father used to say, well, how is your crack whore daughter doing? How's your program working out with your crack whore daughter? Or how is your uh, program working out with your heroin infested son? And my father would rest his case. My system works. How are your systems working out? And for those of you that have trepidation about accepting some of the things I've said, how's your fucking program worked out till today? How has being loved worked out for you so far? How has being liked worked out for you so far? How has being needed worked out for you so far? How have your dipshit parents worked out for you so far? Silence speaks volumes. 25 years at this, and now 26 of me doing this. There's two Asians in that bucket that I'm pulling, <laughs> i.e. two-thirds of the planet are Asian. Sally says I have arthritis in my back from pulling you guys over the goal line for 26 years. I got a sore back. Maybe that's true. Maybe that's true. Psychology of the high performers, which this seminar or my talk should be called, because Steve Jobs, God rest his soul, Warren Buffett, Elon Musk, Henry Ford I that invented the automobile, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, all had one thing in common. They were miserable human beings, hard as fucking nails. Success leaves clues, kids. They had one thing in common. They were miserable human beings. And only at the end of their lives did they try to buy them, their, just in case there is a heaven, just in case there is a nirvana, to buy themselves there by charitable work. I rest my case on myself. I'm no different. I'm buying my way to heaven. But for the first 40 years of my life, I was a ruthless motherfucker. If you had asked me to go t uh, talk for free all over the world, fuck you, what are you, crazy? <laughs> Yet here I stand, soaked, my three-piece expensive suit soaked uh, because of perspiration, but I'm happy to be here. But Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, and Elon Musk all share one characteristic, they're introverts just like most of you. 98% of the high performance people on the planet are introverts, just like you. Only 2% are extroverts, like loudmouth President Trump and myself. <laughs> One of the first things people are scared off by QLA dating back 25, 26 years, well, I can never be like Dan. I don't have the uh, uh, interpersonal skills, communication skills. If you get 5% of my communications, though, this is the second guarantee I make. Remember, if you, if you quit, you're never going to make it. Second guarantee of my talk, you get 5% communication skills as good as I am, you'll be a fucking billionaire with a B. 
5%. If you only want a couple hundred million dollars, you only have to have 1%. Really, all you have to do is not sign your name with an X. Illiterate people that can't read or write sign their name with an X. Don't you have people like that here? Is there anybody in Nepal that can't read or write? No. Well, you must have one of the highest literary, and, li and you're still poor. So education doesn't get the job done either. Now you go to India, and there's a lot of people that can't read or write. We invented or initiated two years ago QLA for dummies <laughs> because we got so many requests on the on our website. I don't understand. There's so much free material. There's 30 gigs free stuff. Where do I start? What do I do? Blah, blah, blah. So we created a program called QLA for Dummies. Tells you, first you sit down, and then you open it, it takes you step by step. QLA for Dummies. And we developed these tests over time, the success test, which only has 95% accuracy. For those of you that have taken it, it's 95% accurate. Really, it's 99.5%, but my lawyers tell me I can only say 95 so I don't get sued. We have an optimism test, a pessimism test, a snowflake test, and a super success test. I can tell you within the third standard deviation from the mean, for you engineers, who's going to make it and who isn't going to make it based on the results of this t these tests. I can really tell you within one hundredth of a million of a percent who's going to make it and who's not going to make it based on the results of these tests. If you never did anything to change after you took the test. We have a lot of kids that have taken the test that have improved and continue to make changes in their life and expand their comfort zone and expand their emotional bank account, etc., etc. But based on the results of the test the day you take it, it's 99% accurate at, the, at the predicting what you're going to turn out to be. And if you really want to have some fucking fun, give your, these tests to your parents. You will be fucking shocked. And they will cry. They may even shit their pants if you're lucky. Extinction learning, overcoming fear by positive experiences. Most of you have the fear of public speaking. Most of you have a fear of rejection. Almost everybody does. I once did, believe it or not, but I did. But it can be overcome. I got a D in public speaking in high school. The first time I took public speaking in university, I got a D. The second time, oh, excuse me, F. And the second time, I got a D. In 1991, when I was brought back as the most distinguished alumni in the history of the university, I went back to my public teaching professor. And what do you think he told you, or told me? Well, we don't always get it right, Mr. Pena. And they don't. And for those of you, I've been called meathead, dunce, retarded, growing up, because I was always a fuck up. And I'm here in spite of all those. Because remember, it's not what they, what they tell you, it's how you relate to what they tell you. What gets measured gets accomplished, gets better, for those of you and, uh, that don't keep themselves accountable, all this is free on my website. Uh, I believe in daily affirmations, daily goals, and at the end of the day that I accomplish those goals, so you keep yourself accountable. True self-esteem has to be earned. And this is the basis of the program, which I'm not going to go through in detail, but basically it was invented by a guy named Andrew Carnegie about 1875, 1880, and it's a jet-driven model, and all this is on my website, free. And it works in third world countries. It works in Bangladesh. It works in Sri Lanka. Notwithstanding, India doesn't think they're third world. It works there, too, because I still think they're third world. And it can work here. It works in China. It works in uh, um, Korea, South Korea. I don't know about North Korea. Uh, it works in the Philippines. It works in uh, Miramar. Uh, it works in Malaysia. It works in Indonesia. It's a little harder in Russia, but it works there too. 
Basically, start up, cash out, repeat, start up, cash out, repeat. We know it's Quantum Leap. And there I am as a barrio bad boy. That was 25 years ago, standing in front of my house, used to live, be right here in this little lot, my house that my, I lived in, 660 square feet, about 55 square meters, to put it in perspective. And the first part of my quantum leap was becoming an officer, 21 year old. The next was the queen anointing me. And the next has been the hundreds of billions that I've created with kids more or less like you. You know that? I don't get any special badges for knowing five presidents. I don't get any special badges for knowing five secretaries of state. I don't get any special badges from knowing all these other people, prime ministers, etc., etc. But what I did gather from all those aforementioned people is how high performance people interact, how high performance people think. You can, the most high performance president I ever met, let me just go back to that, was Richard Nixon. Tricky Dick, which had to leave office because he was being impeached for being a, a liar, a cheat, and a thief. But he was the highest performance president I ever met. So what does that tell you? The most high performance president I met was a crook. I'm not suggesting all politicians have to be crooked, but most of them are. Unfortunately, this is not a part of the world that you're listed in the top economies, as you well know. And what we're doing here today, in these next few minutes, is I'm not distilling what 700 books taught me, because I never read 700 books in my life, but I stopped counting at 700 deals, 700 transactions, 700 financial transactions. And the transactions that I've been involved in now are over 2,000. And you could be the stupidest person in this room and learn enough to be a billionaire if you do 2,000 deals. You can't help. And what I've done is distill the success from those high performance people that I've had the privilege of being exposed to, and I've distilled it into my own theory, and I've been teaching it the last 26 years. And kids, success leaves clues. The most successful person you know or you may have heard of, how does he or she act? What does he or she do? I'm not talking about crooked politicians, because I'm sure they're in the, some of the richest people in this country. But uh, pattern yourself after them. Pattern yourself after Dan Locke. And what keeps most of you away from going out on your own and kept your parents from going out on your own is you realize 99% of all businesses fail. We all have a relative that failed. We all have a relative that lost the family money. But think about one of the top two or three companies in the world now. That's, what his, that's his office, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, looked 20 years ago, 1999. And now look at him. You know how many times they told him his deal wouldn't work? You know how many times his family, his mother and father, said he was going to be a failure? Now he's one of the second or third richest guys on the planet, and at one time, Amazon was the biggest company in the world. Being honest may not get you many friends, but it'll always get you the right ones. Next time your buddies, your mates, are talking shit to you, just say, fuck off, that ain't right. Or you can tone it down, you don't have to say fuck off, but, you know, but... <laughs> Expletive words work best because they're more easily not forgotten. Now, this is a, a tweet from Warren Buffett. Not many people have seen this. You will continue to suffer if you have an emotional reaction to everything that is said to you. True power is sitting back and observing things with logic. True power is restraint. If words control you, that means everyone else can, can control you. Breathe and allow things to pass. I don't, that part I don't agree with, that breathe and allow things to pass. 
But if words from others control you, you're fucked. And the whole premise of Facebook is based on that. The first method of estimating the intelligence of a ruler is to look at the men he has surrounded himself with. Now, if I were to judge you by the five guys you hang with, you fucking chill with, what would I think of you? Probably nothing. How many in this room, it's a question I ask all audiences, how many in this room would want your children, if you have children, or if the children you're gonna have, to grow up and be like your mother or father? How many of you would want them to grow up to be like you? Well, that says it all. Two hands. So I'll give you another 20 hands because you're embarrassed to raise your hand. But a vast majority don't want your kids to be anything like you. A vast majority of you don't want your kids to be anything like your parents. And a vast majority of you don't want you to have kids, you don't want to have kids anything like your grandparents. Well, what in the fuck does that say? What is that saying about you? Your parents, your grandparents, your generation. Not much. This is the man my system's based on. He was a miserable old bastard as well. And bought his way to heaven, if there is a heaven, in the last years of his life. But Henry Ford was a miserable bastard. Rockefeller was a miserable bastard. Steve Jobs was a miserable bastard. The current CEO, Cook, of Apple, wakes his employees up at 4.30 in the a.m. He's a miserable bastard. I'm a miserable bastard. Success leaves clues. What the fuck do I have to tell you? At Amazon, you have to work 80 hours a week to keep your job. 85 hours a week to be considered for promotion. 90 hours a week to get a promotion. The most successful company in the last 50 years. Elon Musk, a slave driver. We've grown fucking soft, Elon Musk, after Vance noted that only hundreds of people were working on Tesla's headquarters on Saturday. Uh, wait a minute, anyway. Notorious workaholic Elon Musk is so tired, uh, tied to the office that he's been known to sleep on the floor. So did I. So did all those names. My mentality is that of a samurai. I would rather commit seppuku than fail. Seppuku is when they kill themselves. All night, no friends, nothing. You know, Musk reveals the lonely 24 hours he spent working on his 47th birthday. Are you getting the picture here? Are you willing or do you even know of anybody that's willing to make those emotional sacrifices? Jack Ma, the richest Chinese guy, has the 996 program. 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week. If you don't work it, you're fired. Are you getting the picture? Bill Gates and Elon Musk share a daily scheduling habit that helps them busy their busy routine. They allocate five minutes for every uh, conversation. They allocate five minutes for every meeting. They have allocate five minutes for every meeting, uh, excuse me, every idea. Five minutes. If you can't sell them on your idea in five minutes, you have to leave their office. Most people can't even say hello in five minutes. Now, QLA is not just for money. Here's one of my success stories of a couple years ago. This little shit, actually, if you make him with brown skin, he looks like you guys. Came to me, he says, I want to be the archery champion of British universities in uh, 2016. Archery champion. He had aspirations to go to the Olympics. And I said, well, what are your test results so far? And he says, well, the highest I've ever finished is 18th. And I, 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 I pull and shoot about 100 arrows a day. 
So I said, I'll work with you. Two, three things. Number one, you're going to have to start shooting 500 arrows a day. And I didn't even think arrows cost money. That didn't even cross my mind. And you need a proper bow. So we had to get a 120-pound bow. The little shit couldn't pull a 120-pound bow back. And uh, number three, you got to put on 20 pounds of muscle. So that's him after putting on 20 pounds of muscle. And that's also him collecting first place of British University Archery, 2017. Put a little brown skin on him and he looks in the polys. And it's even better for, well, there's not too many girls in there, cutting weight off your fat asses, gals. I, she's a professor at Columbia University. I cut the weight off that fat girl like with a fucking chainsaw. And the flap just fell off. Women say QLA is better for dieting and self-worth and self-esteem than it is for making money. Most women have low self-esteem. And why? Because men treat them like shit so they begin to think they're shit. Yes, I turned eight hundred dollars into four hundred and fifty million in eight years. Thank you. Yes, I'm the fifty billion dollar man. But more importantly, I've created teenage multimillionaires. I've created the largest deal on the planet, the five hundred billion dollar Neom deal in Saudi Arabia. I'm more proud of that because I had nothing to do with them. And this is my teenage multimillionaire in his jet plane. We all know what you were doing as a, a teenager. We don't have to repeat it. And he's Asian. I forget the fact that he's half Korean, which means he's Asian 100% to everybody else. Now, when he came to the seminar, this was his roommate, university student, engineering student from Poland. I added this slide because of the group I'm going to speak up. Point up. When I went back to speak at his university, very similar to what I'm doing now, I said, as a university student, he made 1 million euros last year. 1 million euros, which is about $1.4 million, while he was still a student. Now, that's a lot of goddamn rupees. Not one single person in the audience came up and asked him how he made the million. Not one single person in the audience. Because most people pretend that they want more financial success. They're not really serious. Teenage, another one, this was my first teenage multimillionaire. He's not a teenager anymore. Matt Posius. This is a kid, an Oxford kid in the audience. The Oxford, he came to the seminar, made you know, hundreds of millions. This is a kid who was a mechanic, uh, worked on cars, fixed carburetors flying around in his jet plane, but he's, he's 35 years old, so I, I don't brag about him. There's Josh again. And this is, Josh, before he even came to me, he said, my goal is I wanted to own this. This is on the big island in Hawaii, and this is, was his house that he dreamt of when he was 14, 15. Again, we know what you were doing when you were 14, 15. And he's Asian. Uh, we know that. I told you about that. The biggest deal. There's my mentee signing the biggest deal in recorded history, 500 billion. Um, we know that. These are just success stories. He came to me. He was a pizza maker, and uh, he now makes motion, major motion pictures with big time stars. Uh, and this is my more recent success. He came to me, cried. He said, you can't do it in Hungary because of the corruption, crooked politicians, and bribery. He's now the third largest owner of hospitals in Hungary. Uh, this is a current uh, university student. He's not a superstar yet, but he's soon to be a superstar. Uh, and to date, I've created $775 billion with kids more or less like you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the great thing about me, for me is there's no algorithm for engineers. Sometimes I have to explain what an algorithm is, but I won't have to do that in this audience. 
There's no algorithm for experience. So you can't write with code, you can't write a program for my over 50 years of thousands of deals. And virtually all the other gurus, some of which are pretty good. Dan Locke could be one, he's pretty good. Brian Rose is another, he's pretty good. But they have the experience that I am sweating down my crotch right now is more knowledge than the entire industry has. The entire industry. Not even remotely close. We don't have to make every mistake ourselves. What differentiates high performance people? There's thinkers and doers, kids. I want you to leave this talk. You're arguably a thinker now because you're engineering students, most of you. I want you to go out and start implementing and become doers as opposed to just thinkers. And it's not a journey because you don't have to make all the mistakes. It's a process. You have a model to follow, not just me, but on, on the website. Mentoring, of course, I didn't know we were going to be at um, Everest yesterday, but uh, mentoring successful people never reach their goals alone. That was Sally helping me up yesterday. That was Sally helping me up. And when we got out at 18,000 feet, I did, Sally and I both felt a little dizzy. I didn't think I would, but we both, I mean, we had trouble walking, uh, on, not, not just because the ground was like this, but because of the uh, lack of oxygen. We know that top athletes, I told you about introverts, mentoring started with Plato, Socrates, and uh, uh, Aristotle, excuse me. We know all that, I've been at the Naval Academy. Now I'm gonna have to put a new slide for you guys. Um, now, I couldn't find a picture with rupees. But the, the, the bottom line is, I want you to be like this. Instead of that cocaine that you cannot afford to snort, I want you to be snorting up rupees. In spite of what your parents say, as long as it's legal, moral, and ethical. Legal, moral, and ethical. And I believe it's time for Q&A. Thank you very much, kids.